The Azure Management Portal is really just a web interface that you can hit from any browser, and it's reachable through the URL portal.azure.com. Now, in some cases, you might notice that the portal will actually have the words preview on it. That's because Microsoft previews new versions of the portal as they add new features to it, and they'll keep both portals alive at the same time, and you'll have the option to switch back and forth between them. And typically, there's a long overlap while both portals are still active. While core services will appear in both portals, not all functionality may be available in both. Newer services may show up only in the newer portal first, and older services and functionality may only exist in the older portal. The message here is that if you don't find something in the older portal, check the newer one and vice versa. So let's check out the portal by actually working with it and creating a service. So here's the Azure Management Portal. I've gone to portal.azure.com and logged in with my credentials. And you can see it places me on something called the dashboard. This is my initial view of all of my services that I have configured, which is very few right now. Now, there are a couple interesting things about the dashboard. First of all, it's extremely configurable. Notice that I have a toolbar that runs across the top here that allows me to create a new dashboard, edit the current dashboard, share this dashboard with colleagues, go full screen, clone the dashboard, in other words, create a copy of this one that I can then edit and make it suit my needs, or delete this dashboard. Let's go ahead and create a new one. This will be called My Dashboard. And notice that I get some tiles here that I can just drag and drop into the system in order to create my dashboard experience. Once I'm done customizing, I can click the button and now I'm on my dashboard. And so notice that it has a different view. And I can switch between them by clicking the drop down arrow and going back to the original dashboard in order to see what my original one looked like. This allows you to create multiple dashboards, each one focusing on a specific service that you want to be able to monitor. Now, one of the other things that we can do with this is we've got a sidebar here on the left-hand side. Notice that it can be collapsed if you need to, in which case we just get icons. I actually prefer to keep it open so that I can see the text. But this is how we actually create new services and resources within Azure itself. And there's a couple different ways we can do it. You can go to a specific category. For instance, I could go to virtual machines here, see all the virtual machines that I have configured, and then click add in order to create a new virtual machine. Alternatively, I can click back on the Azure logo up here to get back to my dashboard, and I can go to the sidebar and click New. When I use this approach, it's actually going to show me all the different assets that we can create right here as pull-out little sections they call blades. So these little slide-out boxes here are called blades, and they specifically focus on just one aspect that we want to work with and I can then click the close button in order to move backwards in the hierarchy stack. And so as an example, perhaps I'd like to create a virtual machine. It shows me all the featured apps that are here, and so I could say, well, maybe I'd like to create a virtual machine based on SQL Server, in which case I click this, and it will walk me through the process of actually creating a new virtual machine that has SQL Server pre-installed on it. Now in this case, I'm going to go ahead and close that, and I'm going to back up. And instead, I'm going to go to the Marketplace. And so notice this link called the Marketplace. This actually is a much nicer view to show you all the resources if you aren't sure exactly what you're looking for. And so notice here I can create web apps, SQL Server apps, Windows Server apps, mobile apps. I can also come down a little further and even get other third-party services here. For instance, we could create a new Joomla app. Or perhaps I want to come down to the very bottom here and create an Ubuntu server. Or maybe I'd like to create a Visual Studio server. And so notice here I can see all the different versions of Visual Studio that we can create. And so perhaps I'd like to try out the new Visual Studio 15 with the Azure SDK. And so let's click this one. Notice that I can select a deployment model here. We have Classic and Resource Manager. Azure originally only had the Classic deployment model. And in that model, each resource you create was independent. So there was no way to group them. Azure added in this idea of resource managers, and the idea is it's just a categorization or a grouping of all of the collected resources that make up a particular service that I'm actually using to be able to provide some sort of support to my clients. And so I can create these resource groups that then allow me to kind of interact with all of the different services that are part of that resource. And so generally speaking, you want to go ahead and use resource manager moving forward. And so I'm going to go ahead and click create. 
and then it's going to go ahead and walk me through the process. And notice each one just creates a new blade here, but I can always use the scroll bar and still see how I got to this point. And so I'm going to go ahead and give this a name. We'll call it VS15. I'm going to create a particular hard drive type. So we'll just use the regular hard drive. We go ahead and give it a username and a password. And I tell it what subscription level I'd like. Notice it's telling me that I can't use this password because it doesn't meet the criteria. I needed a longer password there. There we go. I can pick my subscription level and then I can decide the resource group. I'm going to go ahead and create a new one called VS15. Then I'm going to pick a location. I want it to be as close to me as possible. And so I'm going to go ahead and pick South Central US and click OK. Now I can then choose my size. And so notice I have two different particular recommended sizes here. And it has some prices per month. And so it's got D2 standard, which has two cores and seven gig, or A2 standard, which has two cores and three and a half gig. Now I can also go to view all, which is going to give me a lot more choices to pick from. So these were just the recommended versions along with the prices. But notice that I can get all the way upwards of over $1,000 a month with 20 cores and 140 gig of RAM. So it's pretty interesting the, the level of machines that I can create here. And I can go all the way down to the bottom and even get lower end prices here. So for instance, if I'm really just playing with this, I don't want to spend a lot of money to play with it. And so I'm going to go ahead and just pick A1 Basic, which is one core and only just a little bit under two gig of RAM. And so let's select that one. Then I'm going to configure some optional features. So I can say how much storage do I want? What sort of network do I want? What subnet is it? All of these things I'm just going to leave as the default settings and click OK. And then I'm going to get a summary page that is what is the actual validation for this and what am I actually going to create? I'm going to click OK to begin the creation of this virtual machine and it will go ahead and start submitting that to Azure that will then spin up a new VM go ahead and lay down a pre-configured image and then provide access to it. Now that's going to take a few minutes and so we can simply just watch this as it goes or we can start playing with other aspects of our dashboard. So while we wait, let's go back to the marketplace and just see what other types of things we can create. Notice there is a search filter up here so you can type up here if you know kind of what you're looking for. But if I go back in the blades here, I get a list of things that I can actually create for. Now we already saw some of the virtual machines. Virtual machines are kind of interesting. They're essentially just either low level infrastructure pieces or higher level platform pieces that already are pre-installed with software. And we've got several interesting ones in here including different database servers. So notice you can use Oracle or you can use DB2 or SQL Server. We have BizTalk, we have SharePoint, we have Dynamics. We have other types of security software pre-installed. We have Windows servers here, including the Visual Studio one that we just created, but you could also do WebSphere or just a raw Windows VM. We have some Linux-based VMs here that you can use, including WordPress. We have other business applications that you might want to be able to use. And there are even clustered servers here. So notice that we can actually create a clustered set of servers for SQL Server or SharePoint or one of the other providers that are here. Now, if I go back here, we have other types of things like web and mobile. So for instance, we can create a application that is a web app or a web app plus SQL. I can have a WordPress site that's created and spun up. I can do mobile apps or notification hubs. I can do logic-based applications. I can create blogs. We have different starter web apps, including ones based on PHP or just HTML5. We have all sorts of different containers. So there's Bottle or Docker that's here, and so different types of web apps that we can create. We can also do raw storage containers, and so here we have storage accounts, SQL Server, Azure Document Databases. Notice there's Redis Cache here. We can actually go down a little further and pick up some integration services if we want. We also have some analytics servers, and so we can create analytics servers for searching or for managing the database or data analytics like data lake analytics. There's even some data validation services here. So notice that we can do sales and use tax rates or check phone numbers or verify addresses through existing services that are out there. We've got Internet of Things support and so different types of Internet of Things 
applications to be able to connect all of our devices together. We have some networking resources to be able to do VPNs and automatic routing. We have media and CDN like we talked about earlier where we can actually create sites or services rather that are designed to be able to do encoding and streaming of our services and geographically locate them close to our clients. We have enterprise integration pieces here to be able to do things like BizTalk. We have security and identity to be able to put identity up in the cloud and to be able to manage our authentication and our authorization. We have developer services. So notice that we have different forms of developer VMs and services that we can actually utilize such as Application Insights and New Relic. We have business intelligence and cognitive services. This is a relatively new section of Azure, but expect to see this actually flesh out pretty quickly. We, and then we have containers. And so I mentioned Docker, for example. We have Azure containers and Docker databases. We have different types of other databases available here, including MySQL and Postgres. We have Elasticsearch and WordPress plus MySQL available here, along with Memcached. So other container pieces that we can actually create. All of this available right here from Azure, from the marketplace. So let's go back to our dashboard. Notice that our Visual Studio VM is now up and running. If I click on the block in the dashboard, it'll take me to a dashboard that's specific to this virtual machine. And here I've got a set of properties that I can use to be able to look and see what's happening on this virtual machine. And I have some information related to how to get to this machine. So for instance, here is the public IP address that I would actually use to hit this machine with remote desktop. And remote desktop has already been enabled and it's all set up based upon the username and password that we configured the virtual machine with. Now, one of the things that you can do with this is notice that when we hover over one of these things, there's always a context menu and I can pin some of this to my dashboard. So for example, we can pin this CPU meter to the dashboard that then allows me to see exactly what's happening with this VM. And then I can drag it around to be able to kind of place it exactly where I want, or I can even configure it with a different size. And so for instance, we could say, let's make this two by four, or even better, let's make it four by two, so it kind of stretches across here. And so we can move these things around as part of editing our dashboard experience. And again, this is just one of those things that we can customize pretty extensively with Azure. But let's go back and go back to the VM here, and let's pick up this IP address. If you click on it, notice that you'll get more details about the IP address here, including other settings that are here. I can copy this. If you just hover over it, it'll give you a little copy. Click to copy. And then I can open up Remote Desktop. And so let's go ahead and open up a Remote Desktop connection. And let's connect to this VM. And so we'll just connect by IP address. It'll ask me what my password is. I'm going to go ahead and say More Choices because I actually want to use a different account here. And we're just going to make it Mark and type in our password that we configured before. And it says it can't verify this, but I'm going to go ahead and allow it to connect. And then notice it's logging me in. And so I'm now in this VM, super easy to create. The VM already has Visual Studio set up, the new version, Visual Studio 15. So this is the next released version of Visual Studio beyond Visual Studio 2015. And it pulls up the server dashboard, which I don't really care about, so I'm going to close this for now. And instead, I'm going to go here to the Start menu, and I'm going to go find Visual Studio Preview. And we'll go ahead and launch it. Now once the IDE comes up, and it will take a while just because we put it on such a limited machine, we'll have to sign in with our MSDN account. I'm not going to do that, but you can see that it did come up here, and then I have my Visual Studio 15 here. I'm going to go ahead and exit, and then close out this VM. Now, before I close the VM itself, or remote desktop out, I'm going to go ahead and shut the VM down, just so that I don't incur any additional costs. And so I'm going to right click and say shut down, to make sure that the VM machine itself is, is shut down, and I'm not uh, incurring any, any particular cost for the VM to run because you pay for CPU minutes. So that's an important thing to remember when you're dealing with these VMs. If you don't want to be charged for them, then go ahead and make sure to shut it down. Now I'm back in my Azure portal here. I can click on the portal to get back to my dashboard. And now if we actually went over here to virtual machines, 
I'd actually find that I do have a virtual machine here. And so this again allows me to find my virtual machines. In the same way, I can also go to resources and see all the resources that we have allocated. So notice that there's a bunch of resources that are related to that virtual machine. And I can go to resource groups because I defined a resource group called VS15 that is all of those resources collected together. And so once I'm finished with it, I can come here and I can delete this resource group by typing in the name of it, VS15, hitting delete. It'll ask me why I wanna delete it. I was just trying it out, so I'm okay with that. We just submit our feedback. And then it will go through and delete each one of those things that was created in order to support that virtual machine. So this is one of the reasons why we wanna use resource groups over classic is with classic, I'd have to go and delete each one of those things individually. With resource groups, I can actually get it to delete all of them together by maintaining a relationship between them. Then I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of them off of my dashboard. So I'm gonna go ahead and close that and close that. And then I'm back to my regular dashboard view. And eventually these will disappear as well, simply because they're still in the process of being deleted.